Please do feel free to take your seats as Carol Paul is going to come and bring to us our reading for this morning, which in your few Bibles can be found on page 970, as she reads from Paul's second letter to Corinthians, uh, chapter 12. Paul's vision and his story. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man of Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not honour. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should lead me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my witnesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with witnesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here ends the reading. Whenever uh, I used to go for interviews, the, the question I, I hated being asked most of all was, oh, so can you tell us what your strengths and what your weaknesses are? Because um, to be honest, I, 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 I don't difficulty telling them my, my strengths. When it came to the weaknesses, I always was like thinking, how honest really should you be? <laughs> you know, because I think if it was a list, if it was a list of them all, I, I don't think I'd be employed anyone. So, um, as a bit of a joke, uh, I used to say, my only weakness is, is that I'm too perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Which none of them ever bought. Um, because, because the truth is, we don't like thinking about our weaknesses, do we? We don't really like to dwell on them. We like to think of things we're good at rather than things that we're, we're bad at. We don't like being weak. You know, part of, uh, I think that might be the reason why, why perhaps, uh, as, as well as keeping fit, I, I, I think a lot of people like to go to the gym because we want to look strong, we want to feel strong. Because we think it will, if we're a strong person, is infinitely more useful than a weak person. We think, well, anyone is weak. Weakness is useless, right? And strength is useful. And so if you're weak, you're no good for, for anyone or to any thing. And I think very often we carry that notion in, into our Christian lives. After all, it's, it's, it's certainly not uncommon for, for, for me to hear, perhaps it's not uncommon for, for ourselves to hear, or even to say things like this, you know, if, you know, if I wasn't such a quiet person, if I wasn't such a shy person, then I think God would, would, would make much more use of me than he does. And funny enough, someone else in the room might say, well, you know, if I wasn't such a loud person, or perhaps if I was just a little bit quieter, um, then I think I might be more useful to God. Or perhaps some of us might say, you know, if my circumstances were only better, 
then I think I'd be more useful to God. Or if, or, or if only my health were a little bit better, or if only my mind were a little bit quicker, and so it could go on and on and on and on and on. The argument was basically God, if, if only I was something other than what I am at this moment. If only I was something other than this weak person. If I was strong, then that's the kind of useful individual that God would use for his kingdom purposes. Someone who's strong, someone who has it all together, someone who was perfect, someone who was never failed. That's surely the kind of person God looks for. That's the kind of person God uses. Right? And so I wonder, as we come to look at this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, which, which Carol just very helpfully read for us, if we have ever considered the possibility that your limitations, that the things that are your weaknesses, may actually be the very thing, may actually be the key to your usefulness in the service of Christ. The very thing that your limitation, the very thing that your weakness may actually be the key to your usefulness in the service of Christ. Now, I, I, I had this kind of uh, mini series, which is Power in the Christian Life, which began last week with the Holy Spirit. Um, this week is Power in Weakness, and next week is going to be Power in Love. Um, but uh, God works all things uh, for, for the good of those who love him. Uh, because uh, I, I, the more I thought about this passage, I thought, what better passage is there, actually, as we're about to enter a time of weakness? Like, mission, good for those, but not for me. I, I, Lord, I, 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 I could never do mission of any kind of salt. I'm, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not able enough for that. Because that's the very issue that Paul addresses here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That God's power is most evidently displayed in human weakness. That's what Paul's getting across in these verses. And so let's begin with that, with, with, with our weakness. Because Paul is undergoing um, a time of suffering, which he refers to in verse 7. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now Paul doesn't elaborate what that thorn was. He just basically says it was a thorn in the flesh. He doesn't say any more than that. And there are others who have guessed, well, Paul was talking about some kind of physical thorn, like a pain or, or an illness. Others speculate perhaps Paul was talking to the Jews who were constantly opposing him again and again in his message uh, and so on, that, 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 um, that they were the constant thorn in his side, as it were. But Paul doesn't actually clarify what, what, what exactly this thorn is. And I think that's actually uh, a good thing. I, I think it was Ronnie, our prayer meeting just the service, said once the same, which had to clarify in my mind, I must be right. <laughs> this one. Um, it, 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 it's actually a good thing that Paul doesn't clarify because we can now see ourselves in the place of Paul and his thorn. That, 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 that we ourselves can now relate to Paul and his suffering. That we can find a commentary of our pain here. And so we don't know what the thorn was, but Paul does say what the reason for his thorn is. He says that the reason that the thorn it was given in his flesh was to stop him from being conceited. Now he also says, that it's a message from Satan, so he says Satan brought the thorn in some way, but he says it, it was, and ultimately God used it to stop him from becoming conceited. In other words, Paul is saying the purpose of this thorn to come into his life was basically to help keep him humble, to stop him from getting a big head as a whole. To stop him getting a big head, Paul says that he was made weak. He was brought to a place. To stop him from, from having a big head, uh, he was brought to a place where he was uh, able to realise his own limitations. And as I thought about this week, it kind of made me think, you know, that there are times where perhaps I don't find it easy to sleep at night or, or wake up in the middle of the night. And it made me think that if, you're, if you, perhaps if you can identify with that, have we ever considered that perhaps the thing that keeps us 
awake at night, or perhaps it wakes up in the middle of the night, could again be the thing to our usefulness. Maybe some of us have said during the night, you know, God, I, God, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with waking up at half three in the morning. Um, uh, would you just take this away? Part of that in my own life has perhaps been, um, I, 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 I've had to come to realise perhaps one of the reasons I wake up the middle of the night is perhaps I need to, to learn myself, you know, I can't even get a good night's sleep without the power of the Lord. And maybe through our sleeplessness we would finally come to a place in humbleness where we would admit actually that we are weak, that, that we need to, we need to depend on him. But this power also raises the possibility that there is something more important in our lives to God than just our comfort. Because if all God wants us was Paul to be comfortable, he would never allow any kind of forward to into his life. But the fact he does, he allows Paul to become uncomfortable, he allows Paul to go through a time of suffering, means that there is something more important to God in Paul's life than just his comfort. Have we ever considered that perhaps God allows things, certain things to pass into our lives that would, that would become the means that reveal our weakness? Also that we would not become big-headed, but would actually become the means by which we are useful. And so knowing our weaknesses, and knowing the fact that we are weak, is a useful thing to know. It is a good thing to know, because I know that without thorns, that without being, being made aware of my own weakness, then I know I very easily become even more unbearable than that which I am. Then I would be more of an unbearable compass saw than perhaps that I am at times. But, and so while a thorny experience, you know, Paul isn't saying that he enjoys the pain. You know, Paul isn't some kind of masochist who kind of enjoys the suffering, who enjoys the thorns. <coughs> He doesn't enjoy the thorny experience. But he says it can. And he says while it doesn't bring about a good time, God can use it to bring about a good end. Because it, it, it's not in our strength, but in our weakness, that the power of God can be most clearly seen. Our weakness. But that brings me on to the second point, which is our boast. Because when it comes to the Christian life, are we those who boast more about our strengths, or do we boast more about our weaknesses? Probably not to think about it for too long. It's very natural to boast about the things we're good at, isn't it? Rather than things that we're not so good at. But just as one of the ugliest things in a person's life can be pride, spiritually pride is equally as all possible. You know, spiritual smugness is not a Christ-like characteristic at all. You know, Jesus, who is perfect, who is sinless, who is the one, and he could have been as smug as he wanted to be. He could have lured his, his perfection over everyone. And yet he did. It. Yet he did. It. I think one of the main problems about the Corinthian church is that they were full of both. They, they had both pride and spiritual pride in great abundance. Corinth, as, as a city, was the capital of, 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 of the Romeo Greek culture. It was a very important, very powerful, very influential trade city. And they had money. I mean, they had wealth. They had power. They had influence. And so the church bought into them. You know, the people, in, some of the people in the Church of Corinth, they really, really believed that they were our son. They thought that, you know, we are the ones who are really important. And so some of the people in that church would have walked around with great swagger. You know, the real deal is here. Look at me. And they would have used uh, their wealth and their possessions. They would have pointed to things. Look, look how wealthy I am. Look how much I have. I must be blessed by God. Listen to me, God is clearly blessing me. They boasted about their strength. 
Look how good I am. Look how much I have. Look how strong I am. And this is clearly seen earlier on in the letter when Paul argues against those that he sarcastically calls the super apostates in the church, which were a group of, of false teachers which had um, wormed its way into the church um, and who claimed to have this kind of special revelation from God, which was, which was better than Paul's. And so they should listen to them rather than to Paul. You know, they wanted something kind of like Star Wars Christianity. You know, big revelations, big spiritual power in the force and so on. They wanted power. They wanted more power. They wanted great strength. But the trademark of Christianity isn't power, but weakness. Because how does Paul deal with this thought? Well, we see in verse 8 that, be, that he begins with prayer. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So again, clearly Paul didn't enjoy the pain. He was the masochist. He prayed for God to take it away. But then we find Paul's answer um, to his prayer in verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is, su is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So three times Paul asked, and he hears the word, no. Now I don't know about you, but if there's one answer I hate. It is getting the word no. I really, really don't like being told no. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it can really be irritating, can't it? I see a few people nod. Uh, so maybe you like me that find comfort then in the fact that you know even someone uh, 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 as big and as great as the Apostle Paul likewise heard no at times. Because the, Paul, the, 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 the fact that Paul asked three times is significant. Um, because three is, is a perfect number in, in Hebrew thinking. It really mirrors Jesus in the Garden of Get, in, in Gethsemane. He prays three times and he hears back the answer, but yet not my will, but yours. So the fact that he heard no after asking three times would have been a, a, a complete, would have been a definitive answer for Paul. Because Paul, after hearing this no, would have been like, okay, well this is clearly, this is clearly what's going to happen. But not only does he get an answer, he also gets an explanation. For God said that his power will be made known in weakness. My power will, will be made known not in strength, but in weakness. It's in weakness that his power is made known. Charles Spurgeon, who's the great 19th century Baptist preacher, probably regarded as one of the best preachers ever to exist, was used mightily by God throughout his life to, to preach to, to thousands who gathered in his church Sunday by Sunday. And yet he spent about a third of his adult life sick. He suffered with chronic illness, a long history of poor health, and yet despite his weakness, God's power was made perfect. Oswald Chambers, um, another very famous Baptist preacher, they're all Baptists this morning, um, uh, in, in the 20th century, he's both, he's both a preacher and, and a writer, but he spent many, many years suffering from really debilitating mental illness. He had great bouts of depression in his life. And in fact, in one case, it even led him to lose his faith completely before God used him powerfully. One of his greatest uh, pieces of work is his, our utmost for his highest. Um, it's been around for 100 years, it's never gone out of print. Um, great book if you haven't read it, I do highly recommend it. But you know, God uses the saints who are brought low for a season before the power comes into the, in, 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 into the oxymoron of the Christian life, which is power, or power, as they say in these parts, in weakness. I was actually on the phone to my mum the other day, and I was talking about something, and I, and I said the word power. And uh, I, I kind of thought, that, oh my goodness, I'm going naked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but power, power in weakness, power. 
which is why Paul continues in verse 9, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, Paul doesn't boast then in his strength, he boasts in his weaknesses. Because it's, 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 it's in my weaknesses that I seek the power of Christ at work. It's in my weaknesses that the power of Christ is resting on his life and on our lives. And so Paul says the power in the Christian life is not found in strength but in weakness, so that we would boast in Christ and not in ourselves. And that brings me to the last point, which is on our power, our power. For Paul concludes this passage in verse 10 with these words, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I wonder if any of us have ever seen any of the Rambo films. Have, 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 have any of us ever heard of Rambo at least? There's a few more heads, that's good. Um, I've, I've seen a, 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 a good number of them, and I can't remember which one it was, but there's one of the films where John Rambo is, is captured by the enemy, and he's basically strung up, and they're about to torture him. And so they, they take off his, his shot, and as they do, they, they very visibly recall and take a step back, because as they look at his body, they can see that it's been covered in scars. His body is covered in scars. And they get scared because they know what his scars mean. I mean, they, 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 they think, you know, this, this guy's been through one of us. You know, Rambo's scars speak for him. And so the scars defined Rambo. And I think the scar is again one of the registered trademarks of the Christian life. Because Paul also has scars. He has scars from his ministry. And he speaks about his, his scars only a chapter earlier, back in chapter 11, from verse 23. He writes, I am talking like a madman, with far greater labours, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. I mean, whoa. He certainly didn't have an easy time, did he? You know, seven times Paul mentions the word danger. Three times he says he was beaten. Three times he says he was shipwrecked, and five times he says he was lashed by the Jews. Perhaps some of us would think, well, you'd think he would have learned that for the first time. But in this, like Rambo, Paul lifts his shirt and shows his scars. And he reveals that from his weaknesses, God's power flowed. And from our weaknesses, from our scars, God's power can flow. You see, Paul knew that because God's power was in his weaknesses, that he then could take risks. Paul took risks. He risked getting beaten, shipwrecked, and so on. And yet I think so often in our own lives we become so risk-averse. Never willing to step out of our comfort zone. That we feel so weak that we can't do anything. I think Paul's message would be, well, of course not in your own weakness. But that's what the Holy Spirit is for. That's what God promises to be with you for. So you can be willing to be vulnerable. You can be willing to take risks. 
And I'm sure that some of us here this morning do carry scars. Perhaps some of us walk with a limp in our Christian lives. Because in living for Jesus, we will get scarred either on the inside or the outside. And some of us will have been hurt. We, we do still carry the scars. But we see in Paul's life that our scars can make us humble, which keeps us faithful, which leads us to being fruitful. And I certainly know that's true in my own life. And I know I've spoken about it before, but. I have a, a stammer, I have a, I have a speech impediment, um, and I've asked God to take it away a lot more than three times, I can tell you, uh, probably more times than I can count. Um, in school, I couldn't read in class, if someone came and asked my name, I couldn't even say my name, uh, I just couldn't get it out. And so, I was terrified of, 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 of public speaking, or just speaking in general, really. Um, and so, uh, as a result of my stammer, I was bullied about it in school, and so I hated, I really detested my standards, apparently it still does. <coughs> and so the call to leadership in God's church was not something that I would have chosen for myself. And so when I felt that God was calling me towards ordained ministry in the church, I, 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 I tried to make a bargain with him. I said, Lord, if you want me to do this for you, then I need you to do something for me. <coughs> and that is, I really need you to take away my stand. Lord, I hate it. I, I, I don't see what's ever going to be useful. It, it, it's embarrassing if nothing else. It, it really serves no purpose. And you know what God's response to me was? No. No. And what I discovered over time is that I had to learn that into my weakness <coughs> would come God's power. I had to learn that God didn't call me because I am all sufficient. Or because I am self-sufficient but rather because his grace is all-sufficient. Not because I'm self-sufficient, because by his grace, he is all-sufficient. The spiritual mass is never my weakness plus his strength equals my power. That's never the equation. Rather, it's my weakness plus his strength equals his power. My weakness plus his, plus his strength equals his power. Because it's when we're weak, the Paul says, that Christ's power dwells in you. Christ in you. That's the reward for those who serve him in weakness. Christ will be in you. And what better reminder is that as we come to a time of mission, probably even all of us could have a list as long of us. Or we start here and roll the whole way down to the church of reasons why we couldn't do it. And say, well, I clearly can't be involved in that because I'm too weak. And yeah, we're weak, but, but Jesus isn't. Which is why we boast in Christ and, and not in ourselves. But also as we come to communion, we also come to one who carries scars of ministry himself. For on his hands, on his feet, in his sight, he has the scars from the cross. Scars that Jesus got for us. And I think the scars of Jesus are beautiful. And likewise, I'm sure that when we get to heaven, our scars will shine. They will, they will be like badges of honour, because they are badges of faithfulness. And so do you think you're too weak, too limited, or too scarred to be of use in the service of Christ? Those things may just be the very things that through the power of Christ is displayed. The very things in which Christ's power can be displayed. For when we are weak, then we are strong. Let's pray. Father, as we come to gather around your table, and as we give our lives to you afresh, Lord, we thank you that it is not the strong but the weak that you use to show your power. So pray that you would come and use our limitations, come and use our weaknesses to show just how wonderful and how great our Saviour is. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>